Happy Pete. Good to see you. What's going on, Nick? Another another day, another dollar, another Monday, another Boating Tips Live, week 16. Good, good seeing you too, bud. And what, what are we talking about today? Talking about a little bit of anything and everything, huh? It is, man. It's just kind of like, well, see what some people can throw at us. Hopefully we can answer your questions. If we can't, we'll probably uh, find out the answer for you and get back to you next week. Oh, cool. Ch check this out, Keith. We uh, The comments all popped up on our... Uh, yeah, I see them there over on the side, which is good. So that's uh, that's awesome, guys. So thanks thanks for asking these questions beforehand. Obviously, we're going to get to those first. Um, a lot of great stuff over there, so we're really excited to answer them. Anything and everything that comes up to your mind today, that is that is what we're talking about. So if you think that you can stump us, if you think you want to pick our brains about anything and everything, we're, we're here and we're answering all questions. And like Keith said, if we can't answer them now, we'll go with somebody that knows what they're talking about and in service team or something and we'll, we'll get that answer to you too so let a, let a couple other viewers join in here got some good numbers showing up already but of course as always you can catch us right here on facebook live which is at marine max leisure instagram and youtube at marine max online and twitter at marine max so so that's you know where to find us you can catch all these episodes after the fact too i know a lot of you guys are working and stuff so you're not able to hop on live, but we, we do see those questions that you ask also after the fact. Yep. Yes, we do. <clears throat> so, so what'd you do this weekend, Nick? Get, we'll get some more people logged in here and I know you guys had a boat show over at uh, a little like a boat show type thing over Pasadena, right? Yeah, it, it was good. I, I don't make it over to, Passing a Yon Country Club as much as I should with them being next door. But Marine Max Clearwater actually put on a, a great event. Great event. They had the, the Black Honkies playing, which is a great band, local band. And and it, it almost felt normal there for a little bit. And, of course, they brought two boats that you might not see every day. Not exactly your run-of-the-mill standard boat. We, they had a Sea Ray SLX-R 350, which is the it's like the AMG Mercedes is what Jason called it. And it is just – it's something else with the 450 that boat is awesome. I, I have not driven a boat with the 450R yet, and that's that's next on my list. What what are your experiences with, with that boat particularly and those engines? We had that boat come in here new, and uh, our techs rigged it. I haven't had a chance to run it yet, but it's sitting here in the showroom, man, and it's, it's freaking awesome looking. Yeah. I'm surprised it's still here, actually. I mean, everything else is selling and stuff, so it's not going to last long, so – Oh, it, it doesn't even do it justice. You should have seen it all lit up at night. Oh, yeah. No. Nope. Then, then, of course, they had the 32 Aviara, too, which that's something that, that we've got a little more experience on, have a few of them delivered around this area. Yep. Day boating luxury boat. Uh, great running boat. Nice deep V on it. Cool boat. Oh, they, they do they do ride great, too. They're not just a good-looking boat. I mean, I've – I've even compared them, you know, even we always talk about whaler being the cream of the crop with their ride, which it is, but you know, it's, it almost feels like I'm driving one of those whalers when I'm driving one of those Aviaras. Yeah. Hey, it looks like we're up to almost 70 people here already. So let's go ahead and just jump into some of these questions. And, and as we're going along, everybody else jump in here and, and shoot away. Okay. Cool. Um, what do we got? First thing first, we got What's that? Are we going to go in order? Yeah, let's start out with Denise and walk our, work our way on down. You want to go ahead and read cool. it? Yeah, I'm thinking of buying a sailboat, a Pearson 31, 1988, and have a boat surveyor looking at it tomorrow. Wonder your thoughts and if you had any comparable Pearsons to, to view before I do. So I, I don't deal in sailboats. Keith, I don't know if, if you've ever had any experience with them. Uh, not really, not particularly. I mean, some of the marinas and stuff I've worked at and the dock masters at, of course we had sailboats, but, but I'd say you're in the right track. Um, as long as you, you know, you hire a surveyor and, you know, trust their, their judgment, they're going to go through everything on your behalf. And, uh, you know, if, you know, you get a good clean bill of health and it's, you know, priced right for you, you know, I go for it. That's very important. You know, you're buying a used boat or a brokered boat. Or anything like that, you know, make sure you spend a little bit of the money that, you know, to, you know, a penny wise versus a dollar fo foolish or whatever it is, you know, the saying. So, you know, it's great to have a good sur a surveyor look your stuff over before you buy anything. 
Yeah, and, and like he said, that was a good point. I like what you said there about trusting your surveyor. So, so, so marine surveyors, what what exactly they do? They're accredited, and they're going to go through anything and and then everything, and it's a very thorough process. And they'll send you a port a report down down to the nuts and bolts, and it's impressive. And I got a lot of respect for those guys going on different boats every day, old boats, new boats, even I've seen it. And yeah, trust them because that's what they're there for. That's their job. If anything, if anything is going to be of concern it's going to come up in a survey. Yep. They put their signature on it. I mean, they sign off on it as, you know, fact. Yeah. So we got this second one. Got Roger here. Keith, you want to read this one off? Yeah, he's got two questions. I'm looking to purchase a 33 to 35 foot center console trying to decide between dual 425s or trip 300s. What's your thoughts on that? And to keep it from being a brand these brand issue, we're not sure what that is. Assume they are Yamahas. Hellmaster is a big part of my decision. Second question is about how to properly navigate the inlets when they are extremely rough. Think of haul over in inlet, for example. Um, I'd go with the trip 300s. Yeah, know? I'd agree. I'd agree. You know, you got a little more horsepower. You got three engines instead of two. If something were to happen, you're coming home on two. Um, we're a Yamaha dealer. Some, a lot of our stores throughout the country, you know, sell the Yamahas. Nick and I are more familiar with the, the Mercury stuff. These new Mercury, you know, 300s are freaking incredible. They're, they're great motors. Um, and then your Hellmaster, you know, that's, I assume that's kind of like our, uh, the JPO system, right, Nick? It is. It's the same thing. It's, it's a little bit of a different actual joystick per se, but I've, I've used some, they're, they're, they're good. I'd say the edge would have to go to Mercury with, you know, user friendliness and stuff like that, but it's going to do pretty much the same thing. I know that they have, correct me if I'm wrong here in the comments, but I think that their, uh, their, why am I drawing a blank here? Their sky hook is set point or something like that. And, and uh, it's that definitely great. I mean, we've talked about joysticks before in the past. Um, yeah. And the cool thing with it, I mean, you're not having to buy a separate standalone autopilot, it's all integrated in there, you know, whether it's your heading hold, track to waypoint, follow a route. You can build a route and set it to follow the route, and it's going to go from point A, B, C, D, and run you right on around. So, I mean, it's 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 an awesome system. Then as to the second part about uh, properly navigate inlets when they're extremely rough, um, just try to keep your bow up, you know, go, go slow. Um, check the tides. You know, a lot of times if you've got even past, you know, you got haulovers is is notorious, but even over here, you know, past the grill channel. If we've got a real strong rip and outgoing tide and you got a west wind where the it's blowing it up onto the beach and you got the current working against it. I mean, those things will stand, you know, straight up um, years ago, back when I was in high school. I mean, I was running on a, a charter boat and mating on a charter boat. We were coming in past the grill and we came down on a wave and actually hit it wrong. We did a, actually did a 180. We were heading east, coming in, whoosh, it hooked, it caught, we turned around, next thing you know, now we're going out westbound. You know, so they, it can be tricky, but just try to keep that bow up, pace yourself, kind of, if you can just stay, stay like on the back of a wave and just ride the top of that wave right on end to where it sets down and just try not to get, don't get sideways to the, to the wind or the current because that's where you're going to get in trouble. Think about a fish swimming upstream, right? You know, you got your nose into the current or it's going down with it. You don't see them going sideways. So. Um, you're talking about keeping your bow up, Keith. Um, I'm going to talk to the man behind, behind the curtain right here. I don't know if it's Kelly or Mallory. You did a great video that Marine Max Leisure Boated posted last night. I wanted to talk about it a little bit later, and that is trimming your boat, the bow, particularly by, by using your engines to trim. So so what would you do? So you're coming in a situation like that. You're talking about keeping your bow up because you don't want to you don't want to nosedive. You don't want to pitch pull. So would you trim your engines up in that situation when you're coming in to kind of ride on top of it? I mean, maybe a little, but I mean, not a whole lot because it all depends on the speed. You know, you've got to have enough RPMs and enough speed for that trim to be doing anything really, right? So, but if it's, you know, you got the waves rolling in, and if you can just kind of just stay like a surfer gets on the face of the wave and, and goes down, you want to be on the backside of it and just kind of roll on the back end of it as it comes in and just kind of keep that bow up and go down. 
if you come down off the wave, you know, you got to try to get going again so it doesn't come down on you or push you sideways. Yeah. That, that it's, is it's, it's, little... it's just a matter of, man, it's just, you got to play with it and feel it. You know, you watch, there's tons of videos over there. I mean, there's somebody over there with a camera all the time, you know, whether the boats are going in or out. Yeah, I've, I've spent my fair share of slow Sundays at Marine Max St. Pete watching those videos. <laughs> but it's it's real. I mean, a little bit of preparation like you're talking about can make the world of a difference. And Venice is a little tricky one, too, sometimes where that tide really rips in and out of the inlet there. Yeah, but... Just knowing what you're doing. You got Andrew. Good day to all. Good good day to you, Andrew. Hey, Thanks. Andrew. Thanks for stopping in. Let's see. That one's a little bit broken up. I'm thinking about buying a Yamaha FSH Sport 210. I have two young boys, six and four, and want to be sure that I can understand the goal, cost, and time associated with bringing this leisure activity into my life. I would be keeping a boat at my house on a trailer and have many lakes within an hour. I'd also like to take the boat to the coast of the Carolinas occasionally. I really want to know what is the appropriate utilization of the boat is realistically and best for the value at a cost. How many hours per year? So we'll skip to that last part right there, Keith. In Florida, what's the average? About 70 hours per year, you'd say? 70 to 100. 70 to 100. You know, 100 hour services on your engines, 100 hours are annually. So you know, hopefully you're putting a hundred hours on them. Yeah. But e either way, there is a shelf life on, on, you know, that oil and stuff like that. So you, you do want to do your, your maintenance in every 12 months, either regardless about what's going on. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Good question. Wendy Brackett Wendell's watching with us today. She's just wished said hello to me. So I say, Hey, Wendy, glad yeah. to have you here. A lot of good questions. This is a good question here from uh, Webster McDonald Sr. Are the Sarasota Bay fish edible? And if not, how far south can we fish to safely eat? I mean, people eat fish in the Keys all the time. I mean, I don't. What, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know of any red tide. Do you, Keith? Where? Oh, Sarasota Bay fish edible. Yeah. Eat them up. Of course they are. I mean, we haven't had red tide for now, what, two years now? I mean, a, a substantial one. Uh, I hope we never see it again like we did two summers ago. Um, hey, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to do? for RAV4 of a front-wheel drive be used to launch a 2,100-pound Nautica? Uh, check your owner's manual, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to misquote anybody on that, but – you know, that definitely, yeah, I mean, if your motor, if, if your owner's manual says you're good, then yeah, you're good to do it. It definitely helps having that front wheel drive. I mean, you know, in case you have to chirp the tires at low tide and stuff like that. I mean, then again, hauling the boat's never the problem. Stopping it is, right? That's right. Well, trailer with brakes helps. True. True. I got a question for you here, Keith, from uh, Wendy. Well, there's a statement there too, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take claim to that, right? The best scalloping <laughs> captain ever. At, at your learning center in Clearwater, there it says <laughs> best scalloping captain ever. Yeah. So are we? Are you still do boating groups? Yeah, um, but not. We've done a couple things on on uh, on Zoom. We've done women on water class. Uh, we've you know we're doing these boating tips weekly uh, with Nick and I, so you can ask us questions and stuff. Um, hopefully, uh, the way the trend's going and the COVID numbers are keep coming down and stuff like that, we get back to normal here real soon. And uh, yeah, we're going to open it back up, and we'll be doing the women on water classes, the intro to boating classes. Um, and all that stuff. So glad to have you come in and, and sit in on one of those classes. Looks like it looks like we're getting close to 80 viewers here. So so if we can break 80, then 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 I will make my week. Not nothing this week will be able to ruin it if we can get 80 fall 80 80 people watching at any given time today. 
everybody's going to drop off now just because you did that. <laughs> they, they are. We just went down to 72. So share, share it up, guys. Oh, I got a good question here. Robert, how is production going with C-Ray Boats Manufacturing? Seems to be hard to find an SLX 230, if you all might know. I figure plants might be slow at getting back into production. So that's a really great question. And, and yes, yeah, so, so there is there's a great demand right now in the boating industry. The market's red hot. And production was slowed up a little bit. With that being said, a good way to that I like to explain it is it, it comes down to raw materials. I mean, you've got TaylorMade making the windshield and stuff like that. You have, you know, Boston Whaler, you know, trying to get as many people in the plant as they can. They are bringing that up to speed. With that being said, it's a great time to order a boat. You know, there is a great chance here with, with there's not being boat shows. There's some incentives being offered on ordered boats, which we usually won't see. So you can customize your boat down to the gel coat color down to down to the the flooring the graphics you name it and and it's a personable experience and and what the manufacturers are doing they're they're pumping out those ordered boats first they're going to take precedent so so whereas we have a bunch of boats come sit on a lot now everybody's ordering boats uh, it has slowed down a little bit but everybody's ordering boats those are the boats that get shot out so it is coming black it is coming back uh, manufacturing is picking up but i mean like the demand right now everybody's out on the water because it's it's the only thing that looks normal right now. Are they playing catch up? Yeah, but it's 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 not as crazy as we saw it a couple months ago. So they, they are coming back to answer your question, there, Robert. We had a we had a transport here this morning. It had three C rays on it. So three ten SLX, a twenty three SPX, and I think a, a nineteen or a twenty one. Um, the the tw they're all sold. And they're going to be delivering, you know, the end of this week or first part of next week. But uh, but the production's up and running. Boats are getting shipped out. Um, and it's picking up steam. It's going to go faster and faster. So, uh, you know, if you got to get in, get one ordered and get, you know, book your, lock in your spot and get your boat built to your specs and the color you want and what you want on it. And, uh, you know, the sooner you do it, the sooner you're going to have your boat. Those SLX 230s, I will admit, Keith, they are rare birds. You don't you don't see as many of those 230 SLXs, at least where we are. Like in some of our lake regions, like Ozark and stuff like that, it's you, you do see a little bit of them, but you don't see many of them around. But you see a good amount on the water. I mean, I'd say that our most popular selling boats are the SPX series, the 19, 21, 230s. The, I mean, you see those outboard, inboard. You see those all over the place. Yeah. So if you can't find your SLX 230, I don't know if you're married to that, but there there are some opportunities on maybe a 230 SPX or even a 250 Sundack or SDX. Yeah. Oh, here we go, Keith. Got Andrew ask a question here. I'll let you answer. Hey, what's the best way to find boats going to Bimini that we could convoy with? Anthony. Anthony Armeo, I know you're still on here. Yeah, you, uh, you can answer that question and uh, help that guy out. But uh, I would say maybe check with your local CETO uh, organization over there, CETO or Boat US. Um, they're bound to have the info on on uh, you know groups or, or boats going over that way. I don't know, man. That's you know that's that's the other coast for us. Yeah. And, and also, Anthony, if you wouldn't mind giving us an update on the Bahamas situation, I, I'd love to hear that, too. We got Gabriel joining in from Yugoslavia today. <laughs> That's the one traveling son of a gun, isn't he? He is. He's uh man. I wonder where he'll be next week. I, I know he's got some big plans and 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 you, you, you can follow him right there on his adventure on Facebook. I think he ought to send us pictures each week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like postcards. You know, like uh, what was that? The, the little uh, where's where's Waldo? Yeah, there you go. Something yeah, like <laughs> where where's Gabriel? <laughs> All right, go, go ahead, fire that one off there, Nick. John, John Hearn, I have a Sea Ray Sundancer 240 2008 first boat. It has a inboard outboard 5.0 Merc Cruiser, it's permanently moored. On an intracoastal near Wilmington, North Carolina, water is a mix of river, freshwater, and ocean, which is the Atlantic. 
would you recommend flushing the engine periodically with fresh water once a month after every trip or just take care of it annually when it's out for the winter? Thanks in advance. So flush it every time. I mean, I, I, I get that there's going to be, uh, you know, it's a brackish water. It's going to be mixed between fresh and salt, but every single time in that salt water, flush it out. It'll, it's the number one thing that you can do for preventative maintenance. What do you, what do you think? Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, we've got people over, you know, we've got kind of got the same situation, right? Like Mira Bay and stuff where they're on Tampa Bay, but then they go through a lift and get set into fresh water. But still at a real high tide, you get that salt water and it spills over into the into the fresh water side and, and vice versa and all that stuff. So it's brackish water. But absolutely, you know, take that 10 minutes and preserve your your engine, preserve your equipment. You're going to prolong the life of it. Um just just do it just make it part of your your daily habit yeah and they make it so easy now too on these new four strokes well i don't know how it would be on a on a io 5.0 mercruiser but i mean you don't even need to start your engines or anything i mean you just no no earmuffs you just attach it and just let it be and, and it'll do the job yeah Mallory, I think, put the link up there for that uh, the 350 SLX outboard there. Check it out. Available for viewing in, in Clearwater's nice uh, air-conditioned showroom. What do you got here? Yeah, sure. hey, you you want to run with that one? Which one? Jack? Yeah, sure. I'm going to go back to Webster here. He keeps hitting us up. But, hey, bud, we're, we're not sure on your RAV4. Check with your dealer or read, you know, get into your owner's manual. Um, all right. Jack Patton, thinking about purchasing a 330 Sundancer. One boat has the Axia system. Being new to this size boat, I'm thinking the Axia system is the way to go. Comments, are you handling this boat with Axias versus inboards? Go with the Axias. It's awesome. And like we were talking about earlier, it's going to give you autopilot. It's going to give you heading hold. It's going to give you sky hook. Um, it's the, it's, it's great. You know, now if you go with the inboards, you know, then you're going to, you know, you know, have to buy your own, you know, autopilot and that kind of stuff. But, um, also depends too, kind of, are you going to be, if it's going to be keeping the boat, you know, if it's freshwater, saltwater, going to be keeping it in the water, or if you've got the ability to get it on a lift or a high and dry. So if it's an Axios boat with stern drives, you know, you, you're going to want to get that boat out of the water. Um, if you have to keep it in the water, then you're going to go with the inboards. Oh, we got, we got, we got Will here answered the question. Check your owner's manual. I have a Honda Pilot all-wheel drive with 5,000 pounds towing capacity. Didn't have any issues launching and recovering a 2,500-pound boat. So thanks. Thanks, Will. There you go. Uh, looks like we're stumped for the first time, Keith. We got Jeremy. I don't know if uh, – I mean, I don't know if I could give a, a, a straight up answer to this, but Jeremy's got a 1997 Mercury 175 offshore outboard. Motor mounts are going out. It's not good. Feel a clunk after putting it into forward gear. Is this dangerous to operate? Definitely not good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know the motor mounts are going out already and all that stuff, and it's clunking and all that. Yeah, I'd... I wouldn't feel good about running it. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. Honda Pilot is 3,500 pound towing capacity. Thanks, man. The interaction's good here. It is. It is. You got a lot of questions being answered. Who can I contact to run social ads for Marine Max? They're listening to us in the background. They can reach out to you, right? Yeah. Look, looks like we had Anthony pop on there to answer that question that, that we just answered from, from Jeremy says, 
says from the Marine Max Fish team. Sounds like the clutch dog in a lower unit. Lower unit. So there you go. That's a start. I always refer to the service team because I never want to mis misinform anybody. Okay. Got, got Howard here. You want you want to take that one, Keith? I don't I don't think I know the answer to that one from Howard. Yeah, let me read the question. See what we got. I have a C Ray SDX two hundred and fifty, and every trip I take my navigation screen records each drive leaving tons of marks all over my screen. How can I erase these marks for a clean screen? I think he's referring to track lines, huh? Yeah, tracks. So it's, what's that boat got, Nick? Simrad or Raymarine? So, so a 250 SDX from the factory is going to have either a, a, a five inch Simrad, a seven inch Simrad, or man, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. T typically they'll have a nine inch Simrad is what yeah, okay. digital dash. Um, let me think. You you gonna go, up, go into your settings. So if you're on your chart, go to the settings, go to the settings, go to the settings wheel. Then on the left hand side, you're going to have a screen pop up. You're going to drag it up to where it says tracks, tap on the tracks. And then over on the right, It'll say display or something like that. Then you can hit stop track and then it'll ask you if you want to save the tracks or erase them or, or do whatever, but it'll be in the general settings under tracks. Um, it's in there. I probably did it in one of the YouTube videos. Um, if you go, if you check that out under the boating tips on Marine Max as a YouTube site, um, there's uh, several video series in there on Simrads that we did. And uh, it, I guarantee it's in there how to turn tracks on and turn tracks off. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe Anthony can help us out there, too. Uh, All right. Got Roger here. What are your thoughts on sea keepers? I, I think they're pretty cool, Keith. Yeah, they are. I think it's as cool as it, as it looks in the videos. So my first, my first experience with a sea keeper was on a 400 SLX. And... Of course, we did the thing. We picked it up. We we rocked and rolled with it. We rocked and rolled with it. And, yeah, you, you push it, and it eliminates over 90% roll. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is this: the Sea Keeper does need to spool up a little bit. I'd say it takes between 30 and 45 minutes to get going. And then, uh, and then you're rocking and rolling. It is an expensive piece of equipment. It is. And it used to only be seen on big boats. But now, I mean, you're even seeing them. In, in 330 outrages, I know Anthony last week was saying that their new fishing team boat is going to have a, a sea keeper in it. I think it's a sea keeper to the two or three, but they're making smaller ones now. So it's it, it's not going to be a big boat thing only. And and we've talked about it before, too. I mean, you just don't feel as beat up at the end of the day, too, if you're fishing. Right. The fatigue factor is taken out of it. You know, if you're out there all day, you know, trolling and you got swells and, and this and that, you know, you're not you're not doing that. Same thing when we're bottom fishing, you know, you get out there and the boat's rocking and rolling and all day long, you know, you've been up and down on your, you know, your toes, your knees, your calves, your legs are working all day long. All of a sudden you've got just a flat platform to work off of, you know, and it's, it's great. Yeah, I think, I think that people that get seasick too. A lot of times, you know, you know, how people are, the boat's running and going, everybody's fine and happy. All of a sudden that boat stops. You know, they start, you know, doing that. Well, you don't have any of that rolling around effect at all. It's just like standing on a sidewalk. Well, when I, when I think of the top, the top inventions in the boating world over the past decade or so, some of the things that come to my mind, one of the first one is Sea Keeper gyro stabilization. Then we're talking power pole, shallow water anchors. Then we're talking any iPilot system or Rodans and something like that, a, a digital GPS anchor, and and then FLIR comes to mind too. So th those are so Sea Keepers up there as far as you know innovation and stuff like that. So good good question, Roger. So Aaron's got a question or a comment here. They got a seventy five Boston Whaler Newport seventeen needs some work. It's got an 08. E Tech 90 on it. Unhappy. We just dropped through here. 
unhappy about BRP discontinuing Evinrude. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, go go Mercury, go four stroke. Anyways, you, you I mean you won't be mixing gas and oil anymore. You'll you'll just have better a better experience altogether. I mean, plus with Boston Whaler and Mercury both being a Brunswick company, there's going to be a much better relationship there just for you to get whatever done. There's going to be much, much, much more, you know, statistics and stuff like that too, if you ever need a direct client at a factory. And, and one of the great things I love about Mercury, Keith, I mean, we talked about Yamaha and Mercury and they're both great engines. They are. One of the things that I'm going to say about Mercury, and, and I don't like to give out recommendations very much on the show. I know sometimes we'll do it if they really deserve it. Mercury is a spectacular engine, but they are a phenomenally run company too. I mean, they are a great run company right here in the United States, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. If you haven't visited the plant yet, Keith, go ahead and do it. And nope. and, and and I totally get the, the Evinrude thing. A lot of guys were so loyal. And Mercury even said it, you know, BRP Evinrude was a great competitor for, I want to say, like over 70 years. And and yeah, it's it's a big change. But Give, give give Mercury a shot, Aaron, and, you, and you'll be glad you did. Yep. Uh, it looks like we had a Bahamas update from Anthony there. We had some customers that flew into the Exumas this past weekend and no issues, so that's good to hear. Good. Still got to do co get verified COVID tests, so like within 48 hours before you leave. Yeah. Ooh, here we go. This this is a good one for you, Keith, because I've heard mixed reviews on this from Sammy Shiro here. I made a three-way hose to hook up at the hose once and flush three engines all at once. Is there a risk to the engines? You know, we're talking about Mercury 400s here. What are, what are your thoughts? That's more of a technical thing, but, I mean, you're obviously you're cutting your water flow into a third versus what is typically pushing through there. And um, pretty serious water pressure, huh? I mean, there's, I mean, I've seen a lot of people do it with twins and I don't think twins is going to be an issue, you know, but, you know, going down to doing it for all three, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, if you hook it up and the water's going and you got good water coming out the, the pee hole and out the prop and out the, the, you know, the pickups and stuff like that. Um, but you just want to make sure that it's, the water pressure is enough that it's filling up the whole engine and not just kind of maybe running through like, ha let's say like half the, the lines and stuff like that. That's not getting up to the top. So you may not actually be flushing it out as well. What about those, speaking of technology, what about some of these boats that have a, a push button freshwater flush system now? Yeah, the flush gets, but then, okay. So, but th that case, they still do each individual engine one at a time. So whether it's it's twins, trips, quads, you hook the engine up to the flush kit, then you push a button. If you push the button once, it's going to flush each engine out 15 minutes. You push it twice, it does each engine seven and a half minutes. So they're not, so you would think that, okay, maybe if it's okay to split them up, that they could do two at a time. You know, but they don't. So the, the flush kits and Mercury is still doing them individually one at a time. So you got, you know, good good water flow through it. Makes sense. Cool. Moving on. Let's see. Man, I learned more about Honda Pilots on today's episode than I ever have on about anything. <laughs> Yeah. Jonathan said hi to you. <laughs> uh, hey, Jonathan. Yeah, he's a college buddy of mine. He's actually got a clothing apparel company, Sakana. You, you see him around. Good guy. Does nice. a lot of free environment. He does a lot of beach cleanups and stuff like that. Well, the Marine Max, Marine Max fishing team put a link to the Bahamas uh, travel restrictions. So forget who it was that I was asking that question about it, but you're still with us on here follow that down and click on that link from the marine max fishing team once again marine max coming through with some of the resources we have here right yeah yeah i got a lot a lot of information right there at the fingertips let's see got a lot of questions man but we're gonna get them to, we're gonna get through them today we are because we got good questions these are these are good meat and potatoes question that i think that a lot of people can learn stuff from we got andrew here what's the most reliable 50 to 100 horsepower outboard engine 
we'll be doing flats fishing and no more than 40 miles out for recommendation. Well, I mean, it sounds like a, a small boat to be 40 miles offshore, in, but it, it is what it is. I know, I know that the, the, the 90 horsepower command thrust, Mercury, four stroke, what they put on a lot of uh, 17 foot Montauk Boston whalers has been a good, a good platform. Keith, what do you say? Yep. I agree. hundred percent. So what, what are your thoughts on a 90 versus the 115? You're like when you go up to like a 115 Pro XS, do you think it's a little more snappy? It is. I delivered what I delivered the other day. Oh, so it was a 17 Montauk that had the 115 on it. Mm. That was a fast boat, good running little boat. They are quick. Yeah. And, you know, you're not having to run any kind of hard RPMs with it too. Right. I think that you see it more in your whole shot than you do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Got Abel again. Keith, you want to take this one over? I, I have actually never delivered a 285 Conquest, and I know you guys you guys have sold quite a few out of your location. Uh, I don't have, I'd have to go. 285 Conquest, how much weight does a generator typically add? I don't know what the generators weigh, but I would... I mean, if, if you're here in Florida, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure where you are, but you're going to want to have the generator in there so you can have air conditioning and, you know, whether you've got a grill or I don't know what all you're going to, you know, the options you're going to have on the boat. But, um, you know, whatever the generator weighs, it's minimal. You know, you're going to want to have a generator in that boat. What are your thoughts on a 285 in general? So that's actually one of, the only Boston Whaler models I've never ran. I love it. In a 380 realm. I've never ran a 380 realm. Those are the only two I've never driven. 285 is awesome. Um, I th they might already be sold. I think we had one uh, come in on trade here. Uh, well, you know what the inventory is. I think we, we've got one here maybe. But uh, they're great running boats. It's good. They're, they're good. I mean, they're solid. What Whaler isn't, though? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I've I've ran quite a few 315s, ran a couple 345s, never ran a 405. That's what I meant to talk to you about. You want to give us the spark notes on your little experience with the 405 last week? 405, 405 was phenomenal. Um, it runs it runs great. It's just smooth. It's quiet. It's huge. You know, it's comparable to the 420. You know, except I think you know you're. You might be up a little further forward on the 405 as because compared to the 420. Yeah. Um, if you're going to want to be staying on the boat, if you want the the cabin room and the 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 berths and all that stuff, the 405 is your boat. Um, the 425. So the the customers that we've got that are buying those, they're kind of the if they've got smaller kids, let's say, and they want to be riding up on the bow, mm -hmm. they're kind of opting for the 425 because as you walk around the helm. You're down, in, you're down inside the, the boat. Talking about the 420 outrage? Or the 420, I mean. the four, Yeah. So the 420 outrage, you're down inside the boat, you know, walking up there as opposed to the 405. It's a conquest. You got to kind of step up on the sides and walk around to get up on the sun pads up on there. But huge cockpit space, great fishability, um, beautiful boat. Yeah, it's a beast, too. I, 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 I wouldn't mind. You know, taking that thing out of pass the grill, you know, the next the next gale force. You, you should have made it up here, man. I could have run it. I know, I know. My my fault. Big, big, big important sales guy, not enough time. Two, so two, two, you got cool. Gail Culp here. She's the executive director of the CETO Foundation, too, and I work with her on the North American Sober Skipper Advisory Council. Oh no kidding. Um, so what is the best option for a small power boat for a first time boat owner? who plans to trailer the boat to and from the water. Um, depends on, you know, like the SPX series and, and all that stuff is great. If you want a little sport boat, if you're going to do a little fishing and, and that kind of stuff too, then you got, you know, the Montauks uh, from the Boston Whaler side. Um, what are your, you know, you're the sales guy, Nick. Well, obviously, get yourself a Honda Pilot, and you'll be towing that thing right along. <laughs> uh, so, so, so that's that. And uh, yeah, just, just just keep it simple. I mean, whatever direction you're going to go, 
I mean, the main question that I always ask, you know, to a new boater, you know, just somebody really starting their search, it's okay. Before we start showing different products and stuff, it's what, what kind of boating are you going to be doing? And if, if it's more than 50% fishing, then you might want to lean a little bit more towards the center console, a little bit more utilitarian, like you talked about the 17 Montauk, and just something that's simple, not a lot of systems, not a lot to break, not a huge maintenance schedule either. I'm an outboard guy. I usually gravitate towards the outboards, especially in the salt water. So just for, for an easy, a, a car-like experience is what we like to call it, just gas and go, you know, like on a 16 Sport even or something like that from Boston Whaler. Um, you've got your bow riders too nowadays, like your 19 SPX Sea Rays that are going to be outboard powered boats. Simple, keep it simple, not a lot of systems to learn, nothing that Keith can't teach in an, after, in an afternoon. Yeah. And just well, now that I'm thinking about it, because she's up in Pennsylvania, so probably like the SPX type type boats. Yeah. Anything that would would work really well. Just give me a call, Gail, before you, you know, if you're serious and, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do for you. Uh-oh. I think we're, I think Antonio has got us stumped here. Might, might need to have Anthony hop, hop in and save us. Give that to Allison. Give it to Allison. Let's see. Maybe can I? I'm gonna pull a. I'm gonna pull a stunt here. I'm gonna pull. Allison is Nick's parts manager down there at the St. Pete store. At Marine Max, St. Petersburg. All right, I'll have Allison give him a. Give him a call. Let's see. Oh wait. wait. All right, Roger. This is a good one, Keith. I, I'm excited about this, Roger. Roger Farwell. I was just about to ask your thoughts, and so you said you don't like to give recommendations. Yeah, we'll give some recommendations. What are your thoughts on radar choices? I think that all. I think that Simrad, Raymarine, and Garmin all, all do a phenomenal job. I mean, I, I think that you know different thing, different brands will do better than others. I know Anthony is the Raymarine fanatic and for good reason too but what, what are your thoughts with some of the different you know units and maybe even how they'll overlay on the charts too all i mean like you said all three of them now the technology is so so good um we can i mean i can sit down here at my dock and with i know for with the simrad and raymarines right now if i turn them on and i zoom in i mean that simrad i think zooms down to like 200 feet and you can i can there's a pvc pipe i mean a, a maybe a one inch diameter pvc pipe that's along the edge of a little flat little shoal we've got over here i did it so we've got you know the mangroves come around and then there's a distinct mark you can pick up that pvc pipe on that radar with that and as we're going out if we've got you know kayakers and boat rentals around i mean it's it'll pick all that stuff up and now you've got different modes on these things. You got buoy mode, you know, offshore, harbor, uh, you know, the bird mode that Anthony was talking about a couple of weeks ago that for, you know, picking birds up, um, they're all phenomenal. So um, however you want it, whatever your ease of use is with it, you're not going to be disappointed in a radar. Yeah, you really can't go wrong nowadays. next one here keith do you want to read off nick's comment let's see talk fleshing engine i have a new 215 xsf scout with a yamaha 150. do you recommend adding a quick connect where'd the question go quick connect disconnect to make it easier to deal with the flush out of the connection i think it's a pretty easy system yeah screw it on i mean it's, it's 150 Yamaha is a great engine too. That's 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 one of their more reliable models. Yeah. All right, Judith Rines, what's the best way to anchor your boat when you're in a strong current? A couple of weeks ago, I dropped the anchor over the bow and ended up with rope burns on both hands. So before you set your anchor in the water, go ahead and get the line, the anchor road, 
kind of coiled out and laid out nice so that it's going to free fall, going to go, go out, you know, going to go drop on out. So you don't even have to hold it in your hands. So you can just take it, drop it in. It's going to go down and hit the bottom. And then as you're backing up, if you, know, you do have it in your hand, go ahead and have it like wrapped around a cleat partially so that then you can take and when you do need to stop, you go both sides, both turns underneath both sides of the ear and half figure eight. And then you're going to be able to lock it down. Um, I recommend get yourself a pair of gloves. You know, you just like if you're, you're working out or garden gloves. And then, you know, if you've got rings or, or you're, you know, you get your fingernails, you know, manicured and you got the nails all painted. So throw on some gloves and you're not going to have to worry about, you know, chipping a nail, losing a stone out of your ring or, or the rope burns in your hand, you know, just, and you can just keep those gloves right there next to the anchor locker so they're there when you're ready to use them. Yeah. Good, good, good call on the gloves. I mean, I've, I've had it happen, you know, they're just, especially at, at uh, what's it called? Bunces. I mean, that, that, that's how I can get going there. Motors running during flush or off from Brian. Okay, so this, this is a good question. And uh, on the older engines, you do want to run them to get that, you know, thermostat opened up or whatever. But on the newer ones, according to Mercury, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong because a lot of people disagree on this. When I went up to Fond du Lac, they said that you are good to run it with your engine off as long as, you know, the block is still hot and, you know, everything's still opened up in there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's what the – so it's going to – it depends, right? So if the flush attachment is on the side of your cowling, it's on the port side, you unscrew the little cap, you pull the little hose out, you hook the hose up, turn the water on, do not run the engine. The water's going to push through the block and do all that. Now, if you've got like a, a 25 horse or a 60 or – Maybe the 90s, I forget, but the 90 will have the 40 won't. The, right. So, okay. So, if it's on the, but if it's on the back of the cowling where that little pee hole is where the stream of water comes out, if you've got hose thread around there and the fitting is not on the side, but it's on the back, you're going to screw your hose into that, turn the water on. And on those, you do have to start the engines. And then once again, I'm going to defer back. It's it's in your owner's manual, or you can go onto Mercury's website and all that. But the flush is on the side, like the Verados. You don't flush, you don't start the engine. If you screw the hose in the back of the engine, you do have to start it in order to get the water to circulate to run. And, and, and only I, run it at idle speed. I, I think referring back to one of the questions that we got earlier from a disconnect. I will, I will say this. So while Mercury and Yamaha, any new engine is going to do a good job on a bit and the larger ones with, you know, that port side screw in there. There is an adapter that gets made for some of those smaller engines that makes your life a whole lot easier. You know, like we're talking about the, the connection with the hose threads on the back. So you're not, you know, twisting the whole hose. There, there is a quick disconnect that, that I, I found works pretty great. Yeah. And you're not fighting the hose, you know? Yeah, otherwise you got to roll the hose back seven or eight times so that it can spin to go into the into the engine cowling. Got another question from Roger here. What, what about radar unit sizes? Um, what are your thoughts on open array versus closed array, Keith? You know, that's, that's a question we get a lot, you know, with the radome and stuff like that. I think the, what the open array is going to maybe give you a little bit more range or – you know, might be a little more sensitive for the for the bird stuff. But anymore, I mean, the, the technology has come so far in the last few years. You know, like Simrad, they call it huggable. You know, it's uh, it's not pulsing out like um, X-rays or whatever the kind whatever kind of ray it is that, you know, thing. It's it's, it's they had it at and inside Hawks K in the hallway running. And we were watching people walk around, you know, inside there. So um, it's uh, whatever your budget is. If you if you got a big sport fish, you know, and you got that big hard top on there, and you like to see the the big ray, you know, spinning around, it kind of makes sense. It it looks part of the package too, rather than just a little ray dome dome up there. But 
they're they're gonna it's gonna work phenomenally. Yeah. You're welcome, Judith. Good stuff. Got Tim here. Trying to find a location on the boat for the compressor for the horn of a 2008 Azimuth 55. Horn's not working upstairs or downstairs. Thank you for any input or help. Now, that is a boat that I'm not entirely familiar with, but our service team is. So what I'm going to do, do one of these jobs right here. I'm going to tag our marketing guy in it, and I'm going to have one of our guys reach out to you. You ran a few Azimuth 55 S's, Keith, huh? Yes. Wait. I don't know where it is, though. But um, Frank Rose, Cab Keith, is that just on flushing Mercs, or does that go for all makes on the back of the cowling? I know for sure on the Mercs. Uh, don't take it to the bank on the Yamaha. On that, refer to your owner's manual. Um, yeah, not positive, bud. Can't. I'm not. I can't tell you for sure. Frank's one of our guys up there in uh, the Northeast. Frank is. Yeah. Yo, Roger, it, it, getting some good questions in here, Roger. Thanks. Talk about underwater lights and their benefits to the fishing. Well, your, your, your blue lights and stuff, your underwater lights are going to draw bait to the boat. I mean, I know we talk about sabiki and stuff like that. You can't necessarily do it at night when, you know, they can't, the fish aren't going to, the bait fish aren't going to see what they're going to eat. I mean, you'll draw all sorts of life to the boat, you know, whether it's squid, whether it's, uh, you know, mackerel or stuff like that. You know, back when we used to tuna fish, you know, you'd be able to, You'd be able to draw bait to the boat before sun up, and that's just you know time is money, and that's that's one of those advantages, and and plus it looks cool too, don't you think? Oh, it's underwater lights are awesome. So I was running a this is a few years ago. I was running a Hatteras to Miami Boat Show, and I was in Miami Beach Marina, and I was in a slip, and the tide was ripping out, and the shrimp were coming out with the tide, and the tarpon were stacked up underneath the boats so as the shrimp were coming out the tarpon are blowing up on the shrimp and i had a long handled dip net so i was sitting there as the shrimp are coming through i'm racing the tarpon for the shrimp as they're coming out so we would get them first so we sat down there i got a couple dozen shrimp fired up a, a pot and some boiling water and stuff and you know had me some fresh shrimp cocktail just sitting right there in the on the boat waiting to move into the show the next day but it was the coolest thing man and just explosions all night long underneath the lights and just you know you're sitting you're like looking in an aquarium man it's it's neat it's just it's so fun looks like frank even brought up a good point here that uh the white light is going to work the best for attracting bait so that's good to know i i i, I believe it i believe it yeah looks natural let's see all right, yeah, Tim, we'll wait for our service team to get back to you here. Ooh, got a question from Jeremy here. I think that if Anthony's watching, he might wanna he might wanna hop on that. So radio brand recommendations too. Um I, so I, I mean, if you're yeah. if you're if you're outfitting your boat with Ray Marine stuff, stick with the Ray Marine VHF. If you're going with Simrad, get the you know, the Simrad and same thing with, with Garmin. Um, if you're looking for a handheld VHF or something like that, I mean, my person, the boat one I've got, it's an ICOM. Uh, I love that radio. ICOM makes great, you know, fixed mount radios as well. Uh, they've been in a business a long time. So, um, you know, you can't go wrong with an ICOM VHF radio. Yeah, it's a good backup too. What are your thoughts on wireless main overboard devices like Fell Marines? I saw I saw that a little bit. That, good question, Roger. I saw that a little bit at Ibex, Keith. And basically, what that wow. is, and I know Mercury even has their own version of it too, where it's kind of like wireless crew management, where you know it'll kill the engines or something if somebody goes overboard yep. or, or whatever, something like that. I mean, I, th I think that any any piece of safety gear that you can you know, utilize and, and make sense is it's going to be worth its weight. I mean, if it saves one life, then it's worth it. Right. Yeah. Um, 
Absolutely. I mean, why not? I mean, it's available to you now and it didn't used to be before. And I mean, with the kill switches connect into that. So if you do go overboard, I mean, you, you see it every year. We all know, I guarantee you, everybody on here watching this show probably knows or has seen, know someone or has heard about somebody falling overboard. And what happens when you fall overboard is you're grabbing that steering wheel as you're, as you're getting knocked out of there. So then the engine's turned all the way around, you go in the drink, and then that boat's sitting there doing circles, and it comes back, and more than likely it's going to hit you. So kill switch, kill lanyard, hook that kill lanyard up, especially if you're by yourself. Um, and then, you know, if you've got the capability and, and the technology is there now that you can put a little wristband on, and you get so many feet from the ignition that it shuts it off, why not? Makes sense. Well, one more question here, and I think that we're out of time, Keith. We got Ron. We're up against the four o'clock out. Yeah, before we get kicked off. I have a 170 Dauntless. What would you recommend, Simrad or Garmin? Comes down to preference. I mean, Simrad's going to do things that the, that the Garmin can't do. Garmin's going to do things that the Simrad can't do. I mean, I think that Garmin is relatively user friendly and i think that sim rides have a great interface especially when your hands are wet so if if you want really simple if if auto guidance is important to you and if you want a really simple you can go with the garmin and you get the vision g2 card and then it'll do auto guidance for you if you get with a go with a sim rad or a ray marine they use a navionics chip not navionics chart card so you've got to keep your sim rad unit updated all the latest updates and ray marine same thing and you've also got to update your navionics chart card the navionics chart card is owned by garmin so you've got simrad updates and you've got to do like garmin updates to the to the navionics thing if you do the garmin then their their g2 card then it's just you know i'm here i want to go here and it'll figure it out for you but um looks like anthony checked us here Raymarine does auto routing also. It's with the same Navionics chart card as Garmin. Yep. You just got to keep everything updated. Right. Andrew. Andrew. All right. Every Monday, buddy, 3 o'clock. Eastern time. Eastern time. time. This is uh, what, show number 18? I, I thought it was 17. Might be. But technically i think that this is a typo on my show notes it says 16 but that sounds a little light i'm, I'm going 17 or i'll 18. go with 17 with you then yeah so we will uh we'll be here next week you know where to find us every week three o'clock if the sun rises in the morning we'll be here on boating tips live on a monday you know where to find us and what are we talking about next week keith uh what are we talking about i forgot we got caleb peeler joining us from the panel. there you go one of the um one of the marine max greats and he's gonna talk to us about the boat buying process it's very scary it's very intimidating especially for first-time boaters i mean man and if you go to a boat show it might <laughs> it might muddy the waters a little bit when you realize exactly how many boats are out there huh? so yeah and then just so people know who is who's, who's caleb and what's he do and and all that he's the general manager up at uh marine max panama city beach in a panhandle there so well, one thing I think is so unique with Marine Max is the, the boating community up in New England is different than the boating community in Miami. And the boating community up in the Panhandle of Florida is going to be different than, you know, the Carolinas or whatever it is. So I think that it's going to be a great take. I mean, us being a couple of Florida boys and just running around the bay, running around the, the intracoastal, I think that we're going to we're going to learn a lot, too. And, and I'm excited. Sounds good, man. I'm looking forward to it. It's a good day. It is. Today was a good day. Today was a good episode. A lot of great interaction. Hope to see that next week. And if we if we missed anybody, I don't think we did, but we might have. If you have any questions when you're watching It's Not Live, drop those comments in there. We review them every single week before we get rocking and rolling again. Yep. So. What do you, All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll be signing off of here. See you out on the water. See you guys. See you next Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern.